Hello, welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Trey, and my guest today is Dr. Jake Hebert, ICR research scientist and physicist. We're glad to have you on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. So today we're talking about your favorite subject. I know this because you wrote a book on it. <laughs> right. uh, so today we're going to be talking about the Ice Age. Um, so I think in the popular culture, we're all kind of familiar with at least a pop media kind of idea of an Ice Age with uh, snow and woolly mammoths and uh, saber-toothed creatures and all of that. But uh, Let's let's get a little more specific. Uh, what is the definition of an ice age? You could argue that an ice age is any time where the ice sheets are larger than normal or significantly larger than normal. Uh, and today, those ice sheets on land, they cover about 10% of Earth's land surface. Uh, but there's strong geological evidence that in the past, about 30% of Earth's land surface was covered right. with, with ice. Uh, so that would be called an ice age. Some people say, well, technically we're in an ice age now because we still have the Greenland and, and Antarctic ice sheets. Right. But most people would say, you know, the ice age was a time when it was much larger, say 30% of the Earth's land surface covered by ice. Okay. So yeah. it's not, I mean, we there's even movies about it. It's not some time where the entire, like... Uh, Earth was just like a giant ball of ice. Well, it depends on who you ask. The evolutionists claim, some of them claim that yes, they claim that there were ice ages in the deep distant past where basically the whole Earth was frozen, what they call snowball Earth. We think the evidence for that is pretty weak. Um, it, there's a better explanation for it. Uh, the arguments they use for that aren't really that strong. But we do think there was an ice age. But yes, in the ice age that we're talking about, it's not like the entire planet is covered with ice. It's, you know, the ice sheets don't come down to the, the middle latitudes or down to the Middle East. You know, we think the Middle East was for the most part ice free, although there may have been snow there during the ice age. But the ice sheets didn't come all the way down and cover the entire earth like some people would say. Okay. That makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. So you did uh, mention in passing there that you we do believe that there is an ice age. Yes. Uh, so... Uh, let's let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, we believe that there is just one ice age, correct? correct? Yeah, there's really just strong geological evidence for one ice age. The reason that secular scientists claim that there were ice ages in the distant past is because um, there are places where you see scratches on bedrock, uh, and when glaciers trans move up, move along, sometimes you have rocks embedded in the ice, and they can carve these scratches. Well. It turns out there's other things that can cause that, okay? Mm -hmm. So they, they find scratches on rocks that they think many millions of years ago were close to the equator. And so they think, well, that's an indication that the glaciers came all the way down to the equator and the entire Earth was frozen. But again, that's there's other things that can cause that. That's really not a, in and of itself a strong enough argument to claim that the entire Earth was frozen. Um, and there's other, some other arguments they make for multiple ice ages. Uh, they claim that within the last 2.6 million years, there were about 50 ice ages. It turns out the evidence for that is even weaker um, than the evidence for the supposed snowball Earths. I mean, that, that's really coming from nothing more than a, uh, a secular interpretation of chemical wiggles in deep sea sediments. And it's not strong at all. Mm. Uh, but there is strong evidence for one ice age. We see geological features uh, that are left behind when glaciers melt back. And, right. and we see those today, not just at high latitudes, but at lower latitudes, where today there's no ice. And so that's a strong argument that the ice sheets were larger in the past. Okay. Well, then, then, then let's take this. Let's, uh, let's put on our uh, um, uniformitarian goggles uh, from a thirty thousand foot view, what would the uh, what would an evolutionist say uh, in regard to ice ages? How many were there? How long did they last, et cetera? Uh, I think they would say there were about five major ice ages. Uh, the most recent of these is what you would call the Pleistocene ice age, and within that there are fifty ice age cycles, and those right. cycles are what most people would call an ice age. Okay. Um, but again, the evidence for these other ice ages is very weak. 
And, you know, I don't think they've really got a good explanation for what would cause these massive ice ages in the distant past. I think that's kind of an enigma to them. They've convinced themselves that they did occur, but it's like, well, what would trigger something like that to cause the entire Earth to be frozen? And then uh, how do you get out of it? Because once right. you get into it, get into an ice age like that or a snowball Earth, you know, the, the, the ice and snow reflect more sunlight, so it becomes even harder to get out of it. Mm. Uh, so they really, I don't think they've got a good answer for these earlier supposed ice ages. It's very hand wavy, very speculative. And you get that when you, when you read their descriptions, it's like, well, maybe this and maybe that. Now, for the relatively recent past, what they're calling the Pleistocene, they think that changes in Earth's orbital uh, motions and rotational motions over tens of thousands of years affect the way sunlight falls on the Earth. And they think that at some times in the prehistoric past, you had more summer sunlight hitting the high northern ice sheets. Okay. And so when you have more sunlight hitting it, the ice melts back and you get a warm period. Okay. Right. At other times in the prehistoric past, you have less sunlight hitting those high latitude ice sheets. The ice sheets grow and you get an ice age. Okay. So they think basically uh, that it's these subtle changes in the tilt of the Earth's axis and the shape of the orbit that are ultimately responsible for ice ages. Now, one of the problems with this, though, is that these changes in sunlight are very tiny Okay. And it's very hard to see how they alone could really be the cause of an ice age. And for that reason, a lot of secular scientists have concluded that our climate, the climate has to be basically unstable because you have to take these tiny changes in sunlight and amplify them in order to bring about major climate change. Especially to get an entire snowball of the earth. Right, right. right. It seems practically unfeasible. Well, that's, that's why they're so worried about uh, the, the issue of global warming is because, mm -hmm. because, in fact, if you ask the experts on this issue, regardless of which side of the debate they fall on, they will all tell you that the key issue is what is called equilibrium climate sensitivity. That's the heart of the issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not even is the earth warming up right now. Right. Okay, the real issue is equilibrium climate sensitivity. Everybody agrees that if you were to double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there's going to be a small increase in temperature. Right. Not much, maybe one or two degrees Celsius. The question is, though, what happens after that? Because the Earth is a complicated system. If you change mm -hmm. one thing, that affects something else. And so you have all these positive and, ne and negative feedbacks that could either amplify that warming Okay, over a long period of time so that you get much more warming than just that one or two degrees Celsius. Right. Or you get these negative feedbacks that kind of bring everything back to equilibrium so that you don't have major climate change. Mm. And the issue, everybody agrees, the issue is whether or not climate sensitivity or equilibrium climate sensitivity is high or low. The people who think that it's high are worried about it. And those who think it's low, not so much. Mm. But one of the main arguments for high climate sensitivity is this secular ice age theory that I told you about. Right. Yeah. Which, as, as we know, doesn't hold as much water as they would have us There's believe. some major problems with that right. theory, and, and some of which I was able to point out uh, about five years ago. Awesome. Awesome. Well, okay. So it sounds like there's not really a whole lot of evidence um, for – for the multiple ice ages and, and the evidence that there is there or the theories that there are there is, is, is kind of flimsy. We could say it's on thin ice, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, we could, we won't cause we don't make puns on this podcast. So, uh, but it does sound like uh, maybe one ice age, uh, fits into the creationist model sure. quite nicely. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, and the fellow who did the pioneering work on this is Mike Ord. He's a creation research scientist, a respected researcher, researcher, but he was also a former meteorologist for the National Weather Service. And he figured, you know, basically what you need for an ice age is you've got to keep snow and ice from melting for many consecutive years. Right. Okay. That's it. If you, if you wanted the most basic requirement in a nutshell, that's it. Now, the problem is you need two things to make that happen. Okay. You need, you need heavy snowfall. Okay. And you also need colder or cooler summers. Now, the cooler summers is kind of self-explanatory, right? If the summers are cooler, 
that will keep the, the winter snow and ice from melting. And so that would mean the following winter, if you get more snow and ice, and most of that snow and ice doesn't melt the following summer, the next winter you get more, and so eventually you get these thick ice sheets. Right. Okay? okay, so you need you need cooler summers, colder summers to make that happen. But you also need heavy snowfall because even if you have colder summers, if the snowfall is light, it can still be melted by sunlight. Okay. So you need heavy snowfall. Well, the question is, how do you make that happen? Now, the problem for the secular scientists is that those two conditions seem to almost be mutually contradictory. Especially in the same year, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because on the one hand, on the one hand, you might think you would need a colder winter to get an ice age. Right. It turns out that's not correct. Okay. Because the colder the air, the less moisture in the air, and that means the less snowfall. Right. Okay. So you want warm or mild winters, not cold winters, but you do want cold summers. Okay, well, you know, and you need this to go on for hundreds of years. And for the secular people, they claim it's going on for tens of thousands of years. Right. So you have to have warmer, mild winters, cold summers, warmer, mild winters, cold summers. And that has to keep going for tens of thousands of years. Right. Okay, that's not really realistic. Right. Okay, but something like the Genesis flood could provide those conditions. And this is something that Mike Ord pointed out. You know, we think there was an enormous amount of volcanic and tectonic activity during the flood. We think there was rapid seafloor spreading. Right. Uh, and that gen- you had this molten rock coming into contact with the ocean, and it's going to warm up the oceans significantly. Right. So what that's going to do is just imagine here that it raises the temperature of the ocean, say, 10 or 20 degrees Celsius. Well, what that's going to do is put an enormous amount of moisture into the atmosphere, which means you're going to get more rain and snow, okay? Snow at high latitudes and on mountaintops. So there, there you've got a mechanism for the heavy snowfall. Right. Uh, now, what about keeping the snow and ice from melting? Well, we know that when you have big explosive volcanic eruptions, the kind that put a lot of sulfur into the atmosphere, right. you get these little droplets that we call aerosols, basically sulfuric acid droplets that end up in the stratosphere. And they reflect sunlight. And we know, based on observations of recent big explosive volcanic eruptions like Mount Pinatubo in 1991, that the summer temperatures drop after those kinds of eruptions. Now, interestingly, they don't change the winter temperatures very much, but Mm. they cause the summers to get cooler. And so we think that because of all the volcanic activity that occurred during the flood, that volcanism is going to continue for hundreds of years with gradually decreasing intensity, but you're going to have sporadic eruptions that keep putting these aerosols back into the stratosphere. See, the aerosols normally only stay up there two or three years. Right. So one set of eruptions isn't going to do it. You have to have repeated eruptions, and we think the aftermath of the Genesis flood gives you what you need to make that happen. All of that catastrophic activity. Yes, yes, exactly. And what's interesting about this, you know, it's a fairly simple mechanism. Okay, both creation scientists and secular scientists agree that volcanic cooling is real. Mm -hmm. They also agree that if you could somehow warm up the oceans a lot, you're going to get a lot more evaporation. But for the secular scientists, how do you get the energy to warm up the oceans 10 or 20 degrees Celsius? I mean, that's an outrageous amount of energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, If you're you're holding to a uniformitarian point of view, you can't even really consider something like that. Right. And the other thing is both creation and secular scientists agree that there's been an enormous amount of of volcanic activity in Earth history. I mean, a frightening amount. Volcanic eruptions that dwarf anything we see today. So why can't secular scientists make better use of volcanic cooling to explain an ice age? Well, it's because of their belief in millions of years. They insist that those eruptions were separated by millions of Mm. years and if they're separated by millions of years, the cooling effect is so diluted, it doesn't really doesn't, do anything. Yeah, okay. But if you had a bunch of eruptions occurring together, say, in a few hundred years, you've got a potent cooling mechanism for an ice age. Sounds terrifying, honestly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Would not want to be there during right. that time. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, so does this model have a name? Well, uh, this is sort of my big contribution to creation science. I've given it a nickname uh, the heat model. Awesome. Uh, that was just an acrostic to help people remember the key points. But again, this is Mike Ward's theory, not mine. But the H stands for hot oceans. 
E stands for evaporation resulting from those hot oceans. A stands for aerosols, which gives you the summer cooling. And the T stands for time, the time to make it happen, but specifically the Bible's short time scale. Okay. You need a short time scale to make this work. And together, that, that gives you this mechanism. Awesome. And it fits so neatly into a cool word that has to do with the subject at hand. Yes, yes. right, right. So good work on that. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so we see the flood as a mechanism, of course, for this ice age. So now that leads us to today. Mm -hmm. What were some of the repercussions uh, between, I mean, how long did it last? What kind of was going on during that time frame when it was, when the major ice age itself, of course, we could still say we're in an ice age sure, now, but right. when that particular uh, time frame was ending, what, what was happening well, our best estimate is that it probably lasted about 700 years. And okay. Mike Ord used some heat balance equations to, to come to that conclusion. But we think it took about 500 years for the ice sheets to reach their maximum size and another 200 years to melt back to where they are today. Okay. So it was a relatively short event. And in the creation ice age model, the ice age isn't all that bad. Right. It's not. It's not as cold. Here's here's the great irony about uh, this: is that Siberia during the ice age was warmer than it is today. Okay, which helps explain why the woolly mammoths were able to live in Siberia. That's one of the great mysteries of Earth history: mm. is how could you have millions of woolly mammoths living in Siberia uh, during an ice age? Because today. Winter temperatures in Siberia can routinely be 40 below. Sometimes it gets almost as cold as the surface of Mars. I wow. mean, it's ridiculously cold. Wow. It is very hard to see how even the woolly mammoths could endure those kind of temperatures. And to make it even worse, in the secular model, they think it's even colder during the Ice Age than it is now. But in the creation Ice Age model, it's not as cold. And because you have these warm oceans, oceans are going to be warm even at high latitudes. Right. So you're going to have the, the ocean surrounding Siberia is going to be warm. That's going to help moderate the climate so that even though it was still cold in Siberia during the Ice Age, it's nowhere near as cold as it is today. And that's how you can have millions of woolly mammoths living in Siberia during an Ice Age. We think that as the Ice Age ended, a lot of ice melted and went out onto the ocean and you had the you basically had fresh water flowing out onto the salt water. We think it froze, and when that happened, that's when we started seeing the climate as it is today. Okay, okay. it got a lot colder. So why can't I mean warm oceans? That seems like a relatively straightforward explanation for how you could moderate the climate in Siberia. So why can't secular scientists use it? Well, because they again their belief in millions of years is tripping them up. Mm -hmm. They think that it's always been bitterly cold, for you know. Really, they would say at least 100,000 years, probably more than that. I mean, right. most of them would say it was cold, very cold, going back millions of years. Some of them would say, well, maybe the Arctic sea ice melted 100,000 years ago, so it's only 100,000 years old. But still, yeah. like, you would have to have woolly mammoths enduring these bitterly cold winters for thousands of years. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, well, and it, so Improbable, for sure. Very, yeah. very improbable. And so... Again, their belief in millions of years is tripping them up. And so many Christians, unfortunately, have this incorrect notion uh, that the Bible's short time scale is something we ought to be embarrassed about and we ought to be sheepishly apologizing for. Mm -hmm. They got it completely backwards. It's the key to solving these mysteries of earth history. And what you often find is the reason secular scientists have trouble explaining things is because of their belief in millions of years. Which is kind of ironic. It is. It <laughs> Be is. Because they developed that belief to kind of explain things away, right? Right, yeah. Your passion for this topic is kind of infectious. It's awesome to see. Uh, yeah, this is such an interesting subject, and it is in pop culture all over the place. So it's great to to talk to someone who has some of those answers, uh, who has done the research, and uh, we're really grateful for that. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Can I throw uh, one more thing yeah, in? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, okay. well, yeah. I, uh, Why know, not? I mentioned earlier the supposed evidence for the, the secular Ice Age theory. It's for sure. Ca it's called the Milankovitch theory is what most people call it. Uh, sometimes it's called the astronomical Ice Age theory because it involves Earth, Earth's astronomical motions. Mm -hmm. Well, 
The reason most secular scientists believe that theory is because of a paper that was published in the journal Science in 1976 that was titled The Pacemaker of the Ice Ages. Okay. And it was talking about Earth's orbital motions. Well, what those scientists did was they examined two deep sea sediment cores from the deep southern Indian Ocean. Okay. And they, they had chemical wiggles in those sediments. And, and the chemical wiggles seemed to be telling a story about climate change that agreed very well with the Milankovitch theory. Because the court, you know, if you do the astronomical calculations, you expect astronomical cycles of around 100,000, 41,000, and 23,000 years. But when they examined those sediment cores, they found climate cycles of about 100, 41, and 23,000 years. Right. And that was seen as very strong evidence for the theory. Okay. But what most people don't realize, though, is those age, you know, before you can even do that analysis, you've got to date those sediments. Right. Okay. And, you, and people may be surprised to hear this, but you can't really use radioactive dating to do it because they think, you know, in order to make a convincing case for the Milankovitch theory, you, ha you have to have data going back pretty about 500,000 years. Okay. Now, I don't accept those numbers, but right. if you accept their ages, you got to go back maybe 500,000 years or so. Well, they think those sediments are too old to date by radioisotope dating. So they have to use a different backdoor approach. And it hinged on this magnetic reversal uh, that they'd already dated from volcanic rocks on land as having occurred 700,000 years ago. Okay. And they use that to date the sediments and then get their results. Well, the problem is... Uh, in the early 1990s, they changed the age of that magnetic reversal to 780,000 years. Mm. And what happens is if you go back and redo those calculations, it messes the results up. And that's exactly what happens. And, uh, and I pointed this out in 2016. We've got a lot of papers uh, that are on the Internet about this. We've got papers at ICR.org mm -hmm. that talk about it. With Also, we've got links to the technical papers if people want to read the technical stuff. Absolutely. Uh, but the interesting thing is, you know, I've never seen the secular scientists candidly admit this problem. And it's a doozy. I mean, it's a big problem because the paper that they're pointing to as evidence for this theory, and, and re, let me remind everybody, this is one of the main arguments for catastrophic right. global warming, is basically invalid. I mean, if you go back and do the calculations the way they did it, but you use today's value for that for that age of that magnetic reversal, you get the wrong answer. All of a sudden, it doesn't work. It doesn't the, work. The pieces don't and, fit and, anymore. But what's even crazier, yeah. This it just gets weirder and weirder. What's even crazier about this is the reason they changed that age. Okay, they, they'd already changed it a little bit because they had they'd gotten some more data and they, they thought they, they adjusted the constants for potassium argon dating. And so they changed it a little bit. But then in the early 1990s, they were trying to do what they call orbital tuning. Where that's where you use the Milankovitch theory to date chemical wiggles in other sediments. Okay. Okay, so once they convinced themselves that the theory was valid, they said, okay, well, we can use it to date other things. Right, right, right. So you had some scientists who were trying to orbitally tune chemical wiggles in other sediments, and they never came right out and said it, but you get the sense reading their papers they had trouble doing it. You know, they have a lot of freedom when they orbitally tune because they're, they're able to selectively stretch and compress different sections of that signal to kind of make it do what they want it to. Right. But, you know, sometimes the stretching is too much. You know, it's, it's not even, even for them, it's probably not believable. So what a number of scientists said is they said, okay, we're going to, we're just going to adjust the age of this magnetic reversal. And they said, we think the radioisotope dates are wrong. And at the time, the radioisotope dates were giving an age of 730,000 years. They said, we're going to bump it up to 780,000. Right. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but that was enough to knock the results out of alignment. But the reason they did it is they were trying to protect the Milankovitch theory. So instead of just admitting they couldn't reconcile all the data with the theory, they basically cheated. They overruled their own radioisotope dating methods. And I'm sure the radioisotope dating methods guys were real happy about that. Right, right. Uh, in fact, if you read about it, they say it was controversial at the time. I, and I imagine it was right. because anybody who realized, you know, the, A, they were overruling the radioisotope date, you know, that was fishy. But also 
they were doing it to protect the Milankovitch theory. And the funny thing about this is they were using something that, that at the time they called an Ice Age Rosetta Stone. I mean, they were they thought this is the standard. We can use this to date stuff. And it's funny. They were all enamored with that, that particular sediment core when it gave them the answer they wanted. But when it no longer gave them the answer they wanted, they basically threw it out and started using other sediment cores. Toss it out in the garbage. Yeah, and it's crazy. <laughs> you know, you, it, it, it's not just that they don't really have strong evidence for the theory. You could argue, if you wanted to be hard-nosed about it, you could argue the Milankovitch theory should have been falsified in the early 1990s because they apparently could not reconcile all the data with it. If you really think that I, that, that particular sediment core uh, that they were using to date everything was the, the standard, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you can't use it as a standard just when it gives you the answer you want. I mean, you have if to you use really it all believe, the time. You have to use it all the time. And so if you really believe that's the Ice Age Rosetta Stone, uh, you got to be consistent. And mm-hmm. so I think you can make a strong case the Milankovitch theory really should have been falsified in the early 1990s. Wow. Now, now they, they sort of, I think some of them realized what they had done and they quietly tried to clean up the mess uh, because they came up with another paper in 1997 that was, if you read, they never come right out and admit it, but it looks like they're trying to fix the problem. A little bit of PR going on. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and, but my problem with that is, again, you're being inconsistent. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you, were, you were saying this one particular sediment core was the standard. Well, now it's not. I think the results they got uh, that sort of reset everything, I, I think you can make a case that they were, they were not being truly impartial in the data they used to get that result right. because they didn't use the Ice Age Rosetta Stone. The one that everybody, you know, you would think if you're going to use any one, if there's any data you're going to use, you ought to use that. This but is the gold standard. But right? they didn't. They didn't. And uh, now they give a reason for that, but their reason to me really sounds like an excuse, not a reason. Um, So there's a serious question about just how strong the evidence for this Milankovic theory is. And if you want to be hard nosed about it, you could say there's no evidence for it at all. And Um, yet it still kind of rules the thought. It it is the paradigm. It is the ruling paradigm. And again, this can't be said often enough. It is one of the main arguments for catastrophic global warming. Mm. Uh, there are people out there who are worried about global warming, will t- and they will tell you, we know climate sensitivity is high because otherwise the Milankovitch theory doesn't work. Mm. But <laughs> the point I'm making is you don't really have any good evidence for the Milankovitch <laughs> it theory doesn't to begin work with. Begin with yeah. So it's like, you know, should we, you know, and I just think it, it's incredible yeah. uh, that more people don't know about this. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, another nail in the coffin, right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Uh, for all of our viewers out there, uh, you can see that we have this book, the ice age and climate written by our very own, uh, Dr. Jake Hebert, uh, talks about all of this very in depth. Uh, it is a more technical book. If you want to take a deep dive into the ice age and climate change, uh, this is, this is your go-to source. Uh, so thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Hebert. Sure. Yeah. Well, let me, let me just say one thing about that. Sure. It, 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 it's, I've tried to make it in depth and thorough, but there's, there's really not hardly any equations okay. in there. I've tried really hard to make it understandable. And I think for the most part, I was successful. There's one chapter that's a little bit, and I tell you up front, this chapter is going to be hard. <laughs> uh, but, but I think, I, I think I do a pretty good job of, um, keeping the math simple so, okay yeah. we'll keep it simple yeah uh so if you want to pick up a copy of that we do have those at icr.org store or if you are in dallas texas uh, please stop by our discovery center and uh, we'll be glad to uh, open the doors for you get you a, a copy of the book from the bookstore uh but otherwise um yeah this is the creation podcast uh this is available on youtube wherever you get your podcasts Please make sure to like, review, leave us a rating, uh, share with your friends so that we can spread the truth to more people. Uh, And I'm Trey, and this has been The Creation Podcast. We'll see you next time.